the 16th of January. <laughs> uh, that's the date today. And uh, we had a show that we told everybody about on the 11th of January. Yes, we did. I don't remember much from that night. Um, Good reason, girl. Um, what is going on with that candle, girl? It's Can fine. you stop with your witchcraft over it's there? It's fine. Please? Please stop with your witchcraft. Honey, I will not abide your witchcraft this evening. <laughs> but no. Just every did. other evening. <laughs> but I do. I abide it. Yes. I encourage it. I um, enjoy it. Anywho, live show business. If you're part of the Facebook group, then you probably heard all about it, and you were probably um, so sick either and tired yeah of hearing yes. us talk about it. Yes, but. or maybe you might be one of the three people that's like, man, I really wish I could have seen it. And if so, too bad because you can't see it. But you can hear it, and we're gonna play it for you on today's episode yes. as today's episode. Yes. So a special treat for you guys who weren't able to make it. Um, this was so much fun. I had a lot of um, uh, interesting moments on stage, as <laughs> did you. But they'll hear that soon enough. Um, I don't personally remember slurring as much as I did in the recording. And I think that uh, it's fake news. Um, <laughs> I don't think that I slurred that much. You texted me. <laughs> About one particular slur, uh, and I just don't think that I slurred that much. And a disclaimer, I did not edit. I know you slurred that much. I, well, I, we all know that. <laughs> I, I know you did. We all know that. I believe by the time I got on stage, I was on drink number four. No, you yeah. weren't on four. I, I, I think four. you were on three. No, I was on four. Really? Yeah. You carried four up with you? No, I was. I that was my fourth drink that I had. That you had with you. Yeah, you carried that. I was drinking my fourth. Oh, okay. When I was on stage, Um, Hmm. I promise. uh, This is a disclaimer. I did not um, edit in any laughter. (laughs) (laughs) We didn't use the laugh track, and you can tell because some of the jokes fail. Um, (laughs) Like when I reference a very obscure song about uh, Max von Sydow. Uh, I didn't get it. <laughs> no, no one did because uh, it's an incredibly obscure song, and uh, there's probably like two people who know that song in the world, and I'm one of them. So uh, yeah, um, that was a mistake in stand-up comedy. But listen, we are going to learn. We may not grow though. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Whatever, we're going to do what we want to do anyway. (laughs) No, it was so much fun. And for everybody who came out to Dangerously Delicious, delicious, uh, see, I'm doing it again. Shit. It's a pattern now. I've done permanent (laughs) brain damage. Um, No, for everybody who came out to the pie shop to uh, enjoy the show, um, for whatever reason you were there, whether it was to support us or if you're a newer listener who just met us, um, fucking sorry. Go back and listen to the older episodes because you're going to hear the same shit you heard that night. But right. uh, no, it was really cool. We met some listeners. Uh, we met some listeners that we didn't even know were coming, which is yeah, really was cool. Exciting. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, just thanks to everybody for coming out, and thanks to uh, you know we say it in the sh- in the recording, but I'll say it again. Uh, Pack and Capital Sound for organizing the live show. Mm-hmm. It was absolutely amazing. It was super awesome. Those are really cool people in the DC area um, who do all kinds of events. Yeah, and then that fucking pie shop. I promise we're going to get into the episode, but that fucking pie shop, can we just... It was goals. Honey, red and black decor, burlesque-themed pie shop and bar. Uh Uh-huh. Like, literally, if we could have dreamt of a place to have our first live show, like, I'm pretty sure we would have... That would be it. Like, dreamt that one up. I I had my free slice of pie um, (laughs) after the set, after my fourth drink, and some of Katie's drink, too. Yeah. Yeah, um, somebody told me about that. I was like, that bitch stole my drink. And I um, devoured my delicious it was hot amazing. rod pie. It was amazing. You guys, pie shops, fucking yes. Plus burlesque, plus alcohol. Like, I don't know why I don't live in that bar. And I was trying to, like, work on it with the bartender. Like, I was trying to, like, set me up a spot in the back mm-hmm. to just, like, be there all the time. And be the talent. It, all the time. So, I don't know why. I don't know why he wasn't feeling it. But, anywho, um, yeah, I think that's it. It feels really weird to like 
just record an intro, but should we? I think they're already tired of us fucking rambling. So <laughs> should we tell them up top then? To I guess we oh, should. No, we said stay spooky at the end. Nah, we should say it again. It feels weird to walk away from the mic without saying it. So they just gonna get it twice. All right, you, you gonna, gonna get, get your blessing twice, twice today, today, baby. Today, today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god All roll right, the tape the johnny we got to go and as always stay, stay spooky hello hi everybody <laughs> wow i feel so loved I'm not even the talent. You guys are showing so much love already. Uh, we're all the talent. <laughs> My name is Arnell. I'll be your host tonight. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out to the Haunted Heart and critically acclaimed live. Roaring appra- applause. Come on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Shout out to Capital Sound, Dangerously Delicious Pies, and Pack for hosting us tonight. We love it. We love it. Make sure you stick around after to catch sets from local DJs, um, Raver Baba and Radio Free Human. It's gonna be lit, I promise. I trust. Okay. If you're not sure what to expect tonight, three words, horror, music, and pie. It's gonna be great. First, we'll hear from Katie and Kenny from The Haunted Heart. They're two best friends who enjoy the darker side of life and death. Their their podcast releases new episodes every Wednesday, and they cover everything from horror to true crime to the occult. It's going to be spooky tonight. Later, we'll hear from Jake Ramirez and special guest, Washington Post music critic, Chris Kelly. (laughs) Critically acclaimed as a podcast music listening club um, that explores the context behind great albums, why they're great, where they come from, and who they've influenced. Now, kick back and enjoy the show. Listen, we're just as awkward introduction, introducing on our live show, on our regular show, <laughs> as we are on our live show, so, Yay! I mean, really, what makes the difference, right? That's a fair point. We are here. We are queer, adjacent. Mm-hmm. We have pie. <laughs> we have that. Mm. Katie, no. Damn. No. No. Doesn't work. No, but seriously, we are so, so excited to be here uh, with you guys tonight. Uh, Typically, we are doing this uh, gig in my kitchen, in the dining room, in the dark, with candles, in our pajamas. (laughs) So, a big step up. She's in her pajamas, isn't she? Well, you know what? Fuck it. (laughs) But seriously, we are so excited to be here with you guys in Dangerously Delicious Pies, D.C. And I don't know if you've had the pies yet, but they are, in fact, dangerously delicious. They are bomb. Um, Thank you so much to PAC and Capital Sound, D.C. (laughs) Woo! Thank you so much, you guys, for organizing this event. We're so happy to be here, and we're happy to be here with Critically Acclaimed. Um, Yes! Um, So I know that we're working with a mixed bag tonight. Some of you guys came here to see a music podcast. Yeah? We're going to get there. 
But it's going to get a little weird first. So is anybody on a first date? Anybody? Not yet. Cool. Steven, put your fucking hand down, because I know you're not on a first date. Uh, yeah. Um, so we kind of looked at tonight like a first date, right? Um, it's a mixed bag. We're not really sure where all of you guys stand on like freak levels, right? So we figured, it's kind of like when you're on Bumbler, Bumble. I don't know why I want to say Bumbler. Tumblr's definitely dead. Uh, rip. <laughs> But uh, no, it's kind of like when you're on Bumble and you send somebody like a message or whatever and like he responds and you guys have kind of have like a really cute like back and forth and then you start texting and then it gets real kind of cute and you decide to have a first date and you don't go to dinner because fuck dinner. That's too much of a commitment, right? It's 2019. Uh, we're going to go for coffee, right? Because coffee is the universal first date of 2019. Um so that's kind of how we approach tonight. We're going to go for like a nice medium grande level freak. We're not ready for train to yet. Um, so we thought we would talk about a family film that's like a cult classic. It's really relatable. It's really something everybody can connect with, you know? I believe we're, that's a cue. <laughs> The Exorcist! <laughs> Your mother's a scorching hell! No! I don't know if Holy Gin works the same Fuck. way as Holy Water, but we're going to hope for the best, God, folks. What a bitch. <laughs> no, but seriously, everybody has an Exorcist story, right? Oh, yes. So, when I was growing up, my mother never once allowed uh, the exorcist in my home. Which was weird, because she's the woman who introduced me to horror in the first place. So we would kick back and watch Carrie like slaughter her entire senior class, <laughs> and that was fine. But the exorcist, that was a no-go. Right? Totally. No, my mom was the same way. So, um, two separate incidences, uh, two separate husbands. <laughs> yes. Like mother, like daughter. Uh, <laughs> she, she actually, fun fact, um, she was going to be here tonight with us. Uh, for the live show, you know, it's like a big deal, kind of, sort of. I don't want to put pressure on you guys to, like, laugh, but... <laughs> Say no, but please fucking laugh. No, but uh, please do. No, she was going to be here tonight, and uh, the snow kind of kept her away, but then also I told her what we were talking about, which is, of course, The Exorcist, and she was like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to miss that one. Uh, <laughs> so she was not about it. Two separate husbands, two separate incidences, two separate VCRs, and they <laughs> both got fucked. And so my mom has, like, this super, like, rule against The Exorcist. She, was, she asked me when we were hosting the show, she was like, did you watch it? And I was like... <laughs> and then we just moved on. Yeah, no, it's see, like with my mother, she was definitely afraid of this movie. So it was made in 1973. So she was three years old at the time. She was definitely a young mom. But my grandmother was also into horror, so I'm pretty sure they happened to watch it, and it just definitely significantly uh, affected her. Yeah, I mean, I think there was one story of somebody who had watched, uh, some guy who went to see it. Of course, when it came out, there were a ton of stories that I think maybe, unconfirmed, were PR, drummed up by the people who made the movie. But one guy went to see it, and he got so freaked out that he fainted, and he hit the seat in front of him and broke his fucking jaw. So, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot at the time Listen. in 1973. I love The Exorcist. It's a truly brilliant and horrific work of art. I mean, from the score, which everyone knows, um, Tubular Bells, uh, as the iconic Exorcist theme song, if you will. But what many don't know is that there was a composer by the name of Lalo Schifrin who was supposed to do the um, score for the movie, but it got rejected for being too scary. 
which fucking sucks. I'm like, sorry, too scary? Yeah, too scary. Huh. Okay. I don't get it either. But the director, um, William Friedkin, got super angry and decided, <laughs> instead of relaying the message that he needed to just tone down the score, he decided to just say, fuck it, threw the tapes in the parking lot, and drove away. <laughs> <laughs> and people say I overreact, really. I mean, honestly. <laughs> Come on. I mean, it's kind of like I relate to that a little bit because it kind of sounds like a little bit like how I would react. Truly. <laughs> Truly, yes. Yeah. Do you have mm-hmm. any experience with the podcast and how I react to things? Would you would you would you say that that is a fair statement? Um, I would say that is fair. And that is all I will say in front of a captive audience. <laughs> Yes. He was a late August baby, too. Um, So we probably share some similar characteristics. Um, He was actually recently quoted as saying that The Exorcist 2 was uh, the worst piece of shit that I have ever seen. Um, And that it was a, quote, fucking disgrace. Okay. I could see that. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. So, but the thing is, I appreciate is, honesty in my media now in 2019 more than ever. Yeah, this is true. But the thing is, is that he was actually notoriously difficult to work with, quite like you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even argue with you. Yeah, <laughs> I knew she wouldn't. That's why I made that joke. So this director, he would actually shoot guns behind the actors to get a genuine reaction. Like blanks or like fucking I, I mean, bullets? I'm just, I'm just going to make the assumption that he was shooting fucking, yeah, bullets, guns, whatever you want to say. He was shooting it to get uh, genuine reactions from the uh, from the actors there. Interesting. That's kind of like that scene in Alien that everybody's heard about where uh, the chest burster scene, how like the rest of the cast didn't know that that was going to happen. And all of a sudden out of somebody's chest, they're just like this fucking demon beast. And yeah. Yeah. And in the scene, but a gun that could actually fucking kill you is kind of different. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little, in theory. In theory, yes. So in the scenes where he, um, I don't know if any of you remember where Reagan is sitting there and she's like possessed, and you know, there's that blue cast over the um, over the bedroom, and you see that breath, like you see their breaths of air. That was yeah. legitimate. Oh, so is he, that cold? Yeah, no. He lo- he purposefully lowered the temperature in the room to make it that cold that you could see the breath. Until this day, Linda Blair still says she cannot stand to be cold. I appreciate that because I work in an office full of women <laughs> that run a space heater like literally 24-7. <laughs> and I'm a hot-natured young gal. We can tell. <laughs> I bet. But probably one of the most jarring instances was uh, Mercedes McCambridge, who actually voiced the demon uh, for the film. And she actually gave up her sobriety in order <laughs> to uh, voice the demon. No, wait, she got drunk for a role? For real. How did she get that game? All I can say is I relate. No, but she she chain smoked, ate raw eggs, and drank heavily so she could just get that like genuine, just raspy voice raw to eggs? play the demon. Raw eggs, yeah. God damn, Rocky. Chill out. <laughs> And what's even more fucked up is the director tried to not credit her for the film because he thought that by crediting her, that would take away from the authenticity of Linda Blair. And what kind of fucked up shit is that? Uh Uh-uh. Nah. (laughs) You then gave up sobriety for a role and this motherfucker is going to try to tell you you're not gonna get a credit, bitch. I'm gonna get my credit. Mm-hmm. Best believe. Mm-hmm. Mastercard. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about this because it is set in Georgetown. Yes. And obviously there are the famous Georgetown 
steps. Um, I thought we that's could. Meredith. But that's Meredith. Girl, she's taking a, br- a drink break. <laughs> <laughs> we need a PowerPoint change, baby. <laughs> this I is, appreciate you, though. God this, bless you. There they are. This is how you. You know, may have seen them. This is how you know it is real. <laughs> it's how you know it's a love joke. <laughs> Because we would have edited that out. These became famous because the father in the film thrust himself out the window and onto the steps as he took the demon inside of his body in order to sacrifice himself and, you know, save. Can we talk about the kid who's, like, going for, the, like, the push-up, like, <laughs> Guinness Book of World Records in this photo? Y'all, I did this slideshow, and I Katie, didn't even see that at first. You're, you're respons- she is responsible for this. What is that, I Katie? picked that photo, and I didn't even see that. I hope he made it. I appreciate his AE sweatband. Oh, my God. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> But besides the context of the film, it gathered a, a, just a little bit of infamy. A little mm-hmm. bit. Because of, you know, some strange things would happen on set. Strange and even, things were afoot. <laughs> and even after the set. I can't with you. Oh, my God. <laughs> so what strange things happen, you might ask? What's what strange things happen? <laughs> Thank you. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. So number one, a pigeon flew into the set and smashed into one of the circuit boxes and caused a fire which destroyed the set with the exception of Reagan's bedroom. And what's interesting is in Animal Totems, Pigeons often often deliver messages that you need to purify your thoughts and that you are attracting bad things into your life. So pretty interesting, right? That is interesting. Number two, we know that the film took a year, over a year actually, to produce, which is (laughs) fucking awful. (laughs) That's a lot. Yeah, it's been a year with you, so I can only imagine. (laughs) I can only... Bitch, please. It's been like 15 (laughs) years with me. Come on. Seriously? Oh. I think that was my fault. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm getting a little too intimate with the mic over here. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'll try to control myself. Listen. So, The Exorcist had a few deaths. So, two actors, Jack McGowan and... Girl, I can't even read this right now. This is drink three. (laughs) His name, his last name was Maliaros. I can't pronounce his first name, so that's where I'm going to leave it. Mr. Mr. Maliaros is usually how we'd go about that. They both died while the film was in (laughs) post-production. And what makes their deaths even more strange is that their characters also died in the film. Other deaths that occurred during the filming of The Exorcist included Linda Blair's grandfather and Max von Sydow, who played the Sidow. I'm sorry. Sidow? I'm really sorry. I tried to control it, but Sidow. <laughs> Max drink. von Sydow. Drink. I'm sorry. All right. It's a song. There's Two a song. Sips. Google it. It's a really good song. His brother. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Zidow? Died on Max's first day of shooting. Also while filming, the son of Jason Miller, who played uh, another father, Damien Karras, uh, was nearly killed when a motorcycle hit him. So lots of tragedy going on. Lots of fucked up shit going on. Mm -hmm. You would think that this would mean, you know, this is a sign, right? To maybe fucking stop. (laughs) But then we wouldn't have the brilliant work of art that we have today. So it was like worth it that everybody like, you know, lost their lives for us to watch this movie. In my opinion, 
I don't know. <laughs> Just That's a Slytherin saying. mindset. That's what that is. Yeah. Well, there we go. So while filming one of the possession scenes, uh, Linda Blair was thrown out of bed when a piece of rigging broke and caused her to injure her back. And additionally, after the film's release, Lin Linda received so many death threats um, that the studio had to hire bodyguards to escort her for the next six months. Hmm. <laughs> I don't want to seem insensitive, but like I can't eat my pie during my section, so. So you're gonna eat it during mine? But I, mean, I don't even have pie. Really, it's really good. That was your choice. That's fucked up. <laughs> That's fucked up. In 1987, actress Mercedes McCambridge, who played uh, the demonic voice of Pazuzu, um, was the victim of a horrific tragedy when her son murdered his wife and children before taking his own life. I don't, I don't really have a witty comeback for that. That's just really sad. That's just awful. Please yeah, don't. Yeah, that's, that's I, actually I would, just genuinely fucking sad. We don't have any jokes I would, about <laughs> that. I would hope you don't. I would hope you I have don't, I don't. some level of respect. Some is the operative word. <laughs> so with all of this, many believed that the actual film itself was cursed. Um, and that playing it through a projector was an invitation for demonic possession. A projector like what we have right here? Oh, yeah. Don't worry. We're not going to show you The Exorcist. We didn't pay for the rights to the film. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have we that don't, much Patreon money. I was going to say, <laughs> we don't have that level of Patreon support yet. But I'm going to leave it at that. Tele televangelist Billy Graham uh, was famously stated as saying that there is a power of evil in the film and in the fabric of the film itself. When it was first released, the film was banned um, in a lot of countries. And many people that attended the premiere, um, especially during the premiere in Rome, it was thundering really bad, and there was like a big ass storm going on during the premiere. And a lot of people claim to hear this like super evil demonic cry from outside of the theater. Now, whether or not that was like, you know, the storm or not is to be determined. I mean, it's also Rome, and I don't want to stereotype, but like. If we're going to be over-emotional about something, it's probably going to be the Italian way. <laughs> Very true. And at one showing, a woman was so frightened that she passed out in the theater and you know broke her jaw, like we stated. Oh, was it a woman? It was a woman, oh, actually. I heard it was a man. Not a man. Well, I guess I fucked up. She actually, that same person later sued uh, the filmmaker, suggesting that subliminal messages caused the accident. Hmm. And Warner Brothers actually settled out of court for that one. Because there actually were, um, there's one scene, it's like on a sidewalk. I'm not going to describe it very well. But there's a scene <laughs> on a sidewalk where there, there are a couple of scenes actually in the movie where it cuts to like a demonic face for like three seconds. And it is technically subliminal messaging. Um, so that actually was part of the film, which is probably why they settled. Yeah. It's real scary. We don't have a picture of it because we didn't plan this part of the show. <laughs> no, we didn't do that. So all in all, a total of nine people associated with the film died pretty violently. Um, and the actors themselves gave a lot physically and emotionally. <laughs> um, and this is a segue into what Katie has to talk about. <laughs> is it? Is it really a segue? Yes, it is. Um, so, a lot of us know about the exorcist curse, right? Which but is how, like, your mother, like, so here's the thing. I feel like a lot of it I really was, wish she was here so we could throw to her. <laughs> and just have her come up here on stage? She'd probably be a lot more So here's the honestly. thing. A lot, of, like, there's a part of me that believes that it is real. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, because we all believe that, like, or at least you and I believe that your intentions, like what you put in, you know, you get back, right? Right, right. So if you're doing a film, you know, like this, expect to receive a lot of negative energy back. Right. 
Right. Um, but the studios capitalized on a lot of that. Yeah, I think a lot of it was uh, very much PR uh, and marketing and leveraging the sort of fear that we had of, I mean, obviously, demons are already something to, to fear. Uh, <laughs> not like in 2019, we're chill with it. But like in, in, 19, in the 1970s, in 1973, right, like that was a lot scarier to a lot of people than, nece- than it would be now necessarily. And so I think, I agree with you that that energy um, is there, but I do think that their marketing folks and their PR folks were very smart and they kind of like honed in on that and used that as a tool to market the movie to freaks like us who would go fucking watch it because, you know, we do shit like that. Um, I mean, like, if you have someone like your, like your mother or my yeah. mother who's like, do not watch this, do not watch it, I will not allow it in my house. Right. That would like, yeah. I just want to watch it more, right? Uh, totally, for sure. Um, but that's just me being um, obstinate, and you, I think. Uh, but I what agree. a lot of people don't know, and what I think it was interesting that the PR and marketing folks didn't focus in on, is that the movie was actually based on a real-life exorcism case. Like, that's do- been documented. So this movie was inspired by a 1971 novel called The Exorcist, right? That was written by William Peter Blatty. Uh, And that story itself was inspired by a story of Ronald Doe. So it was inspired, it was a story of a story. Of a real life story. Of a real life story. That's the operative word that I left out (laughs) conveniently. Uh, Got it. Yes. So the case of Ronald Doe is actually very real, and it's been documented in several different uh, sources. Um, And it actually began three and a half miles from our present location here at Dangerously (laughs) Delicious Pies, D.C. Everybody pack up and head out the door right now. (laughs) That's where we're moving. (laughs) Do we have anybody in the audience joining us tonight from Maryland? Anybody? Hands from Maryland? Yes. Okay. Well, this story started in Maryland. (laughs) In Cottage City, to be exact. Um, So you guys can be known for something other than shitty driving. I'm just kidding. I love you, Marilyn. I love you, Marilyn. Um, So this is the case of Roland Doe, who has also been called Robbie Mannheim. And those are two pseudonyms for a real-life person who was named Roland Hunkeler. Who? who, who, Hunkeler. Hunkeler. H-U-N-K-E-L-E-R. Hunkeler. Hunkeler. Hunk. So we're going to call him Roland. All right, Mr. Hunk. Technically. I mean, I think... Depends on what you're into. Oh, we didn't light our candles. Hang on. Wait. Sorry. This is traditional. Oh, damn. Um, for those of you who listen to our show, we always do every show, every episode by candlelight. Uh, so we're going to do this for you guys. Sorry. For those of you who don't listen to our show, it just looks totally unprofessional, but <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway because that's what we do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. Typically, we have sage and all of that Brief stuff, side but joy. no, we're not doing that. Today. I don't actually even know if we're legally allowed to light these candles in here. Don't tell the bartender. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we're talking about Roland Doe. Roland Doe, the hunk. Roland Doe was born into a German Lutheran family living in Cottage City, Maryland. And he was an only child, so... I don't know. I mean, you technically weren't an only child. You have a younger sibling, but I was an only child. I have two sisters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> True. But I mean, you grew up with a younger sibling in the house, right? Yeah. So I was an only child, and I just learned to entertain my fucking self. Um, but Roland was kind of dependent on the other adults in the household, because I guess he had other adults, because I come from a single-parent home. Um <laughs> We're not gonna get into it. Don't be full. Same. Don't feel sad. I had a great life, dude. You it's can fine. all blame our fathers for the <laughs> trash that's up on the stage today. It's fine. Um, so <laughs> it's always fine. Um, 
Anyway, so Roland actually had other adults in his household, and he sort of depended on them for his playmates. So he became very close with his Aunt Harriet. Uh, And his Aunt Harriet was a spooky bitch just like me. And so she taught him a lot of, like, spiritualism because she was very much into that. And at the time, in in the 1940s, in the late 1940s, that was, spiritualism was kind of all the rage, right? So she taught him how to use a Ouija board. She taught him how to do different, like, communing with the spirits, all sorts of things like that. Um, That's what fucked him up. Truly. Uh, yes. <laughs> True. It was her fault. You're right. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, bitch. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately... <laughs> In early January 1949, uh, Aunt Harriet kicked the bucket. (laughs) I'm sorry. Sorry, girl. Death is never funny. No. So after that, Roland began to experiment with a Ouija board um, in the way that his aunt had taught him. Somebody knows. Somebody knows because they said no. I saw somebody. So he wanted to use it as a method of communication to talk to his dearly departed aunt, who he was very close to. Shortly thereafter, strange things started happening in their house. And Roland started hearing, Roland and other family members started hearing scratching sounds from the floors and the walls of their rooms. And one of the earliest incidents was, uh, there was a portrait of Jesus in the aunt's room which is interesting if we consider what she was into. You know what I mean? Like, I don't necessarily know that we would have a portrait of Jesus over our bed if we're having, like, spiritualism orgies every other weekend. Seems to me like it would kind of, like, heavy the mood of sorts. I mean, maybe she was into it. Maybe. Uh, I mean, that goatee kind of does does do a little bit for a... Uh, or a girl. Anyway, um, so one of the earliest incidents was this portrait of Jesus started leaking like water, like Jesus was crying. Wait, leaking water? Water. Like teardrops. Oh, he was crying. He was crying. Not that kind of wet. Different kind of wet. Um, <laughs> so Roland was... <laughs> Experiencing a lot of this weird stuff. He was hearing scratching sounds on the walls. Uh, it sounded like uh, moving in the walls. And also, one particularly uh, mildly troubling uh, side effect was that his mattress would shake violently when he was trying to fucking sleep. And that has a, an impact on, on sleep quality. So... All of this crazy shit was going on, and... Soon it was only, you know, it was only going to get worse. Um, furniture began to levitate in Roland's presence. And I don't know if you've ever tried to redesign your living room. But personally, if furniture would levitate and move its fucking self in my presence, I would be happy about that. It's very heavy. Um, I'm just saying, I would appreciate that. Right? You could just redesign rooms at your own fucking whimsy. I'm into it. Truly. Uh, One of the less desirable traits that began to emerge is that uh, large red scratches would appear on his chest out of nowhere. uh, And he would moan and groan and speak in guttural terms. (laughs) At times it would sound as if he had many voices instead of his own. And obviously this is represented in the film. You said, uh, wait, wait, what kind of voices? Many voices? Many voices. As many in more voices. than one. Many voices? Many. Like more than one. I thought you said many voices, so like squeaky voices. Oh, like chipmunk voices. No, that would be cute. Your mother sucks cocks in you. That's what I thought. But no, that, that would be much cuter than what actually happened, which is Satan. <laughs> uh, also, they noted that Roland had extreme strength. Um, at times when he appeared to be having a fit. A fit? A fit. Damn. A fit, you know. I wish I could have a fit more often. (laughs) So the family honestly was quite alarmed, and they contacted doctors, psychiatrists, and their local Lutheran minister here in D.C., and his name was Pastor Schultz. 
And Pastor Schultz actually came out and spent the night with the family. Um, And he witnessed some of the strange happenings that were taking place in the Doe home. Listen, if you can't figure out what is going on, just call a priest. True. Like my family did for me when I told them I was gay. You know? Technically, it was a pastor because he was Lutheran. I mean, same thing. True. It's, you're right. Um, anyway, so who is this man? Hi. Hello. Hi, baby. Hi. Okay. How's it oh, going? he's a photographer. Hi. What's your name and who oh. are you? Huh? What's your name and who are you? Uh, kimchi. Kimchi. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Hi. Okay. Have you ever Hi, uh, dealt with demonic possession before? Yes. <laughs> oh, tell All us right. more. Um, we're, we're going to see you after the show, Ben. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So, stay over so this there. pastor, Pastor Schultz of D.C., uh, he, he spent the night at the Doe household and recommended immediately that the family seek the help of a Catholic priest. <laughs> so he said, fuck Lutheranism. Uh, you need to call the goddamn Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> he said, fuck this shit. Call the Catholics. He said, I'm out, fam. It ain't me. Peace so, out, bitch. Yeah, 100%. 110%. So they called Father Albert Hughes, who was the local Catholic priest here in D.C., and he got permission from his superiors to perform an exorcism on Roland in late February 1949. Um, but he was forced to stop the right when Roland broke off a piece of spring from the mattress that he'd been strapped down to and slashed the priest's arm open from shoulder to wrist. I thought you were going to go for the throat there. Nope. I'm, I'm a little disappointed, actually. No. Um, Father Hughes didn't make out too good, uh, but he actually never spoke of the incident again. He, he wrote about it one time, and that's what's been included on the research that we obviously did for today's show. Um, but he... After that, he never talked about it again. He kind of just pretended like it, it never happened, even though there's, you know, lots of sources to suggest that it did. That, that it did? Maybe it's a Catholic tradition. Uh, <laughs> yes, Catholicism. Not throwing any shade. I love all of you. So, shortly after that happened, large scratches appeared again on Roland's chest, only this time they actually spelled out the word Lewis. And the family... Lewis? Yeah, Lewis. 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 Who was Lewis? I'll tell you, actually. I have it written in my notes right here. Is that like pedestrian name for Lucifer? (laughs) That's like his nickname? No. um, Roland's mother actually interpreted this to mean that the family was being instruct- instructed or rather threatened to move to St. Louis where they had other family. Um, so I'm going to take the advice of this <laughs> demon that says, hey, move to Louis. No, why would you do that? That makes no sense to me. I don't know. I mean. That's a bad parent. It's a choice. I'm calling CPS. <laughs> Reg- it's about... 70 years too late? (laughs) Um, So, I don't know if my math was good. Y'all check me on that. Um, They will. Roland's mom decided that that meant that they needed to move to St. Louis where they had family. Um, And it appeared in this instance that Roland's body had taken on the role of the Ouija board that he had been so connected to via his aunt. And so now the messages were being sent through his own physical form. That's some bullshit. His aunt was a bitch for that. And that's all I got to say on that. I mean, I just want to say that his aunt was, like, literally us. Like, his aunt was into all of the shit that we are literally into right now that this podcast is about. So, I don't know that we can call her a bitch. I mean, that's fair. I think we can call her morally questionable. <laughs> so we such have, is this podcast. We actually have a picture of the house in St. Louis. This is the house. Isn't it nice, though? Like, look at that house. Like, that's a nice looking house. That would cost you like eight hundred thousand fucking dollars in like Leesburg. 
not even anywhere good. Um, I live there, so I can make those jokes. She can make that joke. <laughs> um, so once they get to St. Louis, this is the house on Roanoke Drive. Um, a cousin of the family who was attending St. Louis University at the time put them in touch with Father Walter H. Halloran and Reverend William Bodern. Can I just talk about how nice those bay windows are, though? Can you just? I mean, like, as a as a potential buyer for a home, those bay windows are beautiful. I need you to the not be. The circle window up at the top is a little questionable, but those bay windows are nice. The circle window at the top looks like it's just waiting for some sort of horrible face to appear as you're coming down the driveway to park. <laughs> yes, so it's here. Did you just snort? Did you literally just snort? I did. I did. Well, good. This episode is done. I'm gone. Good night. Um, so yeah, it's, he it's here at this lovely household that they're introduced to Walter Halloran and William Bodern. And after consulting it's with... It's got a tray list? I fucking need you to focus on the exorcism at hand. This it's is not a trellis? real estate podcast. Look at the trellis. It's got a nice trellis I on the side. I don't know that we can call that a trellis. I think it kind of just looks like it was forgotten and left there. You know what I mean? Like, we just kind of... We have some like, Japanese maples that have seen better days. That's true. Um, and we also have a vine growing up the opposite side of the house than where the trellis is, which is made for vines. So I'm not sure on that one. Yeah. Um... Okay, continue. Anyway, uh, so the two Catholic priests that we meet, Bodern and Halloran, um, after they consult with the university's president, uh, they t agree to perform an exorcism on young Ronald Doe. Uh, with the, I'm sorry, we're calling him Roland. Ronald's his real name. Ronald? So we're going to call him. That was his real name, remember? Ronald? We had that whole thing with, like, Hunkler. Hunk. Sorry, that was my fault. Ronald I did that. I did that to you. I'm, I'm very sorry. He was a hunk. He, of sorts. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, they decide to perform an exorcism with the help of several assistants. And in early March of 1949, uh, Bodern and Halloran converged on the Doe's house on Roanoke Drive for the exorcism. There, they witnessed more scratching on the boy's body and his mattress moving violently, um, which was pretty much par for the course at this point. Um, the two priests did notice a pattern in the boy's behavior. He was relatively calm and normal during the day, but at night, after settling in for bed, he would exhibit strange behavior, including screaming and wild outbursts. Now, that's an actual thing, though. If you've ever researched, like, sundown syndrome... I haven't. That's a thing. Really? You've never researched sundown syndrome? Uh-uh. It's where old people get really crazy at night. Mm. Essentially. Really? Yes. Okay. I didn't know about that, actually. This is the learning moment for me as well and as you. Now you know. <laughs> All right. So, Roland... Roland would enter a trance-like state in the evenings, and he would start making sounds in a guttural voice, and the priests... Um, also saw mysterious flying objects in the boy's presence um, and noted that he would react violently when he saw any sacred object. That's where we get the fuck me Jesus thing from. Um, I'm sorry for the hand gestures. I can't not. I'm, I'm a garbage person. Uh, <laughs> so at one point during this ordeal, Bodern reportedly saw an X appear in scratches across Ronald's chest, and they took that to mean, obviously, as any of us would, that he was uh, possessed by ten demons. Ten? Was it, was it ten? Ten. Exactly ten, because X is like well, the honey, no Roman numeral. Ten is just a good time. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Nine's a problem, but ten is an orgy. <laughs> Ange, I think you have a message, baby. Um, the beautiful thing is, I think it's from our soundboard operator. 
Um, so, okay, uh, in another incident, a pitchfork-shaped pattern of red lines moved from Roland's thigh and snaked all the way down towards its ankle. These types of things happened every night for more than a month to him. Um, on the evening of March 20th, the exorcism reached an unhealthy new level. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, everything that we've pretty much discussed so far has been unhealthy. Now I we're unhealthy. I don't necessarily want any of it um, to happen to me. But it reached a new level for the priests. Roland urinated all over his bed and began shouting and cursing at his priests. So at this point, his parents had decided that they had had enough. They took him. Wait, it was at that point. It was at that point. Pissing. Pissing was where the no, line this, was. He's done. Piss the bed. We're done. That's it. We're done. You better not fucking bed Get wet. this fucking demon yeah. out of him now. Look, this is the 1940s. We don't have that fucking like rubber mat that you wrap the mattress in when your kid is like a perennial bedwetter. Like that's not a thing at this point. Um, that's where they drew the line. Uh, and so they took him to Alexian Brothers Hospital. And we have a picture of that lovely establishment. That is a cute. Uh, it's just really For cute. You. Definitely. Oh, sorry. Oh, wait. Actually, These are guys. Uh, These are the priests. <laughs> so on the left is Halloran, and on the right is Bodern. We can go ahead and move on. I don't think there's much there for the audience. Oh, this, this is, is the hospital. This is Alexian Brothers Hospital. Uh, so this is where they checked Roland in on March 20th for more serious treatment. And it definitely looks uh, serious to me. Would any of you stay the night in that hospital if it was still there? Any hands? Any of anybody hands? brave enough? Uh, all our fucking regular hands. listeners. And literally, are these are the people that we up. know God personally, so that should tell you right then and God there bless. that we are fucked in the head. <laughs> Just saying. So he has got a nice awning, though. Look at that. It's a nice awning. Good fence, we've good sturdy great, fence, so look, you can't get got, the fuck out. We've got great architecture. It's got good bones. So, <laughs> Roland was checked Buried in Buried in its soil. I swear to God. No bay windows, that's true. No bay windows, that's a negative. Unfortun Next. Unfortunate. Thank you. Next. <laughs> no trellis either, no unused trellis. Um... So he gets checked in there March 20th, and on April 18th, almost a month later, it's the Monday after Easter. Uh, I don't Fitting. know why it's sacred, but it is. Uh, <laughs> Roland's room at Alexian Brothers. He wakes up with seizures, and he yells at the priest, saying that Satan would always be with him. I mean, I don't understand what the problem is. Different I'm strokes, maybe. I'm just saying. So the priests respond to this by laying holy relics, crucifixes, medals, and rosaries on the boy's body. Later on, at about 1045 that evening, the priests call on St. Michael to expel Satan from Ronald's body. They shouted at Satan, saying that St. Michael would, bottle, would battle him for Ronald's soul. And about seven minutes later, that seems like a really specific time for an article, because I did the research for this, for an article that was Thank God unspecific. she did the research for, for, for something, please, because let me tell you, on any regular episode, it's a struggle. So about seven minutes later, an oddly specific time for an article that had no specifics regarding names, dates, or locations of specific events. Um, about seven minutes later, Ron Roland came out of his trance and simply said, he's gone. The boy then recounted how he had a vision that St. Michael vanquished Satan on a great battlefield. So there was a fight. And Michael won. That's some Basically. bullshit. <laughs> Nobody jumped out of a window mm -mm. and died. Mm -mm. Just he woke up and said, oh, St. Michael fought this demon and now we're good. You know, he had a seizure for apparently like eight fucking hours. Okay. And, and then what? at almost 11, he said he's gone. Uh, 
And that's pretty much how it ended. And that was kind of one of the more interesting things about researching this case because the movie has such a... The movie, obviously, it's Hollywood, but it does such a great job of building tension and kind of, like, getting you to that climax, right? But in the real-life story, as it often is with movies that are inspired by real-life stories, it, it wasn't really that way. Um, it was kind of anticlimactic. Um, Roland just came out of the trance and said he's gone. And no one actually would have ever known about this exorcism if it wasn't for an article in the Washington Post, which appeared in late 1949, albeit with a few details. Seemed a little um, wishy-washy. <laughs> Uh, that priest had performed an exorcism on a 13-year-old boy. So, Which then inspired William Peter Blatty, yes. who saw the article, because he was at, what's the school? He was attending college somewhere. Was he? Did he go to college? He was attending college somewhere. I don't oh, know. all right. Cool. Good job. Is there a George Washington University? I there is. Know. Is there? It's actually in D.C. Th- that's Thank where, you. Okay, well, that's where he was Probably at. people here have gone there. So he saw... <laughs> he saw an art. He saw that article and decided to write a story about it and then fucking became fucking rich and famous. Which it is did. literally all I'm trying to do. The books... <laughs> The book stayed on the bestseller list for 54 weeks, and it spawned the movie in 1973. Um, The book took a lot of liberties with its source material, obviously turning the main character from a boy into a girl, um, from a boy named Roland into a girl named Reagan. Uh, The movie story also takes place completely in Washington, D.C. and Georgetown, uh, whereas the true story took place beginning in D.C., but then, of course, we had that whole St. Louis interlude. Um, So, uh, following his exorcism, Roland Doe and his family moved back to the East Coast. Not exactly sure where. Um, Sources say that Roland and his wife uh, founded, like, that's a weird word to use. Founded a family? Founded? They found. Do you found a family? You found, found colleges and buildings, but do you found they a family? They founded, I believe is correct. Yeah, uh, so they had some kids. Uh, and They founded some kids. He named his... <laughs> found some kids sounds like you busy. just saw them somewhere and you they just took busy. them in as yours. Uh No, so he named... Roland named his first son uh, after Michael... Because that was the saint that was believed to have saved his soul. And if Roland was still alive today, he would be in his early 80s. So look around and see if he's here tonight. He's probably uh, Roland, are you here? Roland, are you here? So uh, as far as the priest, uh, Reverend Bodern died in 1983 after serving the Catholic Church for decades. Halloran lived until the, two, into, until the year 2005 which sounds like a weird way to phrase that. I'm sorry that I wrote it that way. Um, (laughs) He lived until 2005 when he died of cancer, um, and he was the last surviving member of the main team that had performed the actual real-life exorcism of Roland Doe. The room in Alexian Brothers Hospital... Nope, that's not it. Ah, (laughs) fail! That's the hospital. It's actually still there. Um... (laughs) So the room in Alexian Brothers Hospital was boarded up and sealed immediately following Roland's exorcism, and the entire facility was torn down in 1978. You'll note that that is uh, about five years after the movie was released. The house where the family lived in Maryland is now an empty lot after it was abandoned in the 1960s. And it's curious as to why it was abandoned ten years after it had been occupied by Mr. Roland. I mean... I, I mean, I would, wouldn't mind. I mean, that's a selling point for me. I'm just saying. Technically, maybe we can put our studio there. Anyway, um, <clears throat> as for the cozy house on Roanoke Drive in St. Louis, it sold to new owners in 2005 for $165,000. Perhaps the buyers embraced the fact that Satan may have lived upstairs. Wasn't it torn down, though? No. The St. Louis house uh, survived. Oh. There's a family that lives in it right now. Oh. We should check in on them, see how they're doing. I'm going to ask them how they're doing. I'm going to send them a message. 
Maybe not. <clears throat> hey, y'all. How's it going? I feel like they would probably be our type of people, though, because they bought the house knowing that that happened. Yeah. Didn't you say that there was a um, there was some people who tried to interview the guy who was actually like the Rolling Doe yeah. person? Um, there's actually a pretty decent podcast that's on like pretty this. Pretty decent, unlike this bullshit. No. <laughs> no. Here's the thing, um, and I'll only tell that to you guys, our intimate group who's gathered here. Our of course, intimate group. We all know intimately. Um. <laughs> Uh, there is a podcast that goes in depth into, you know, the real life story behind The Exorcist. And they called, they con- so they contacted somebody that they thought was Roland Doe. And they actually called him on the fucking phone and recorded him. And they were like, are you Roland Doe? Like from The Exorcist? And he was like, don't ever call me again. And I just feel like that was rude. <laughs> I don't, though. Morally, I have things against that, but um, it's called Inside the Exorcist. So definitely check it out if you're into that. Uh, personally, that's probably a little too close for me. Ladies I feel like this guy's been through enough. Stage, Roland Doe. <laughs> Bitch, if we could only. No. Um, he didn't seem like he wanted to talk about it, and if he is the real Roland Doe, then he. Um, he definitely doesn't want to talk about it, and if he's not the real Roland Doe, then he's tired of being fucking asked. Um, but we wanted to leave you guys with a little tidbit about The Exorcist that you and your friends may not know mm-hmm. already. Um, so we have a slide. Slide. There we go. There's the right time. Look at that guy. That made he, an impact. Um, he's got a great set of facial hair going on. Um, a little sleepy. We're a little sleepy there, um, I think. Um, yeah. What's he doing? So that... What's he doing? You might remember a scene that from... That looks the, like he's looking... That does not look appropriate <laughs> for this type of podcast. Katie, not appropriate. Okay, so that's Paul uh, Bateson. Paul Bateson was a 30-something x-ray technician who was at the hospital that the director of the film wanted to film a scene. And you might remember the scene if you've, if you've seen the movie. Uh, Reagan's mom takes her in for a brain scan when she starts showing abnormal brain activity. And in that scene... If only my mother had done the same. I wouldn't be here with you all today. There is... An assistant, right, a surgical assistant who's shown in that scene um, who just sort of helps get everything set up for the brain scan, right? So about four years after filming Wrapped, uh, it was discovered that he had killed six gay men in New York City. And he had wrapped them in uh, actual uh, plastic from this hospital and actual body bags from this hospital and dumped them in the Hudson River. You pointed to that like we had a picture. It's true. We don't have a picture of the wrapping. But that's Paul Bateson. And that case um, was actually very interesting because it sort of unfolded in a really interesting way in which the director got kind of wrapped up in that and they suddenly realized that this guy had been on film in this movie um, and he confessed to the crime and yada, yada, yada. But for more information on that sort of thing, you want to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, Yeah, we are on every major podcast platform except for SoundCloud. SoundCloud fucking hates us, uh, but you can find us on like iTunes. You can find us on like Google Music. I think is what it's called. What the fuck is Google? Music? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's whatever. I've never heard of Google use. Music a day in my fucking life. What as? So you can find us on any major pla- uh, podcasting platform. You can also find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group that's really Listen, cool. I'm gonna tell you what. Right now, we have an awesome fucking Facebook group right now, and we have. Two people who we here have from joined us from our Facebook group, and I'm just saying, like, 
Shit is fucking lit AF. True. They're a lot cooler than us. So definitely join the Facebook well, group. Sure. If you like spooky shit, they'll teach you a lot. Uh, we're also on Instagram at The Haunted Heart Podcast. And we're on Twitter at The Haunted Heart. I wasn't trying to be funny there. There's a fucking character limit for Twitter. And I didn't plan for that. So um, you can find us there. Definitely connect with us. Uh, and that's pretty much. If you want to send us an email. Have you yourself been possessed by the devil? <laughs> yeah, definitely let us know. We would like to know. Send us an email, and Katie will tell you where you can send that email. Wait, did because you take I am my drink and finish in, it? And I don't fucking know our email address right now. This bitch literally took my fucking drink and finished it. <laughs> and I didn't even notice. Shit. I needed something to get me through this. Anywho... Uh, we have a traditional sign-off that we use for the show, so hopefully you guys will indulge us as we wish you good well. And we hope that until next time, you stay, stay spooky. spooky. Get my damn laptop out of here for somebody steals it.